welcome everyone to the Hive. My name's Andrew Woods and I'm the manager of the new facility. It's uh, a fresh facility. We only launched it Wednesday last week and uh, I'll tell you what, it was uh, all hands on deck trying to get everything ready uh, in time for that launch. We had literally three and a half weeks from handover from the, uh, from the contractors until uh, we had a number of people in here last Wednesday for the uh, launch of the uh, facility. The Hive stands for the Hub for Immersive Visualisation and E-Research. Uh, the facility um, is uh, essentially four large displays, uh, display systems, all with different capabilities. Jeff will go through those as, as we go through the talk. But um, there's also a range of software and imaging hardware available as part of the facility as well to uh, make, best make use of these, uh, these amazing systems. Um, so our speaker today is Jeff, Dr. Jeff Jacobson. He's the Executive Director of Public VR, which is based in Boston. US. He's a consultant and scientist with 20, sorry, 20 years experience developing virtual reality systems and managing multidisciplinary teams. He's won National Science Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities Grants and has worked on projects with collaborators and audiences uh, from Harvard, Tufts, MIT, Northeastern and, and Carnegie Mellon Universities. So, how are you, Jeff? Theater. I think most of you have been in those, which is um, uh, 
Uh, we have one over there, except that it's on its side. Um, and uh, therefore, has a somewhat different purpose. Now, 95% uh, of the people who are doing virtual reality call themselves virtual reality people are working in Second Life uh, or World of Warcraft or in these multi-user virtual environments uh, where you log in, uh, you have an avatar that represents you, and you run around and you uh, interact with other people in virtual worlds, and you see it all through your computer monitor. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's one of the best things ever invented, really. Uh, but I wish it had a different name because, uh, you know, the sort of traditional VR people are, are lost in the noise. So, you know, when you do a Google search, 95% of what comes up is this sort of thing. Um, so, if you're interested in that topic, I can give you some pointers. And the reason it works is that you identify with that avatar. You feel like it's that. Um, again, the, you know, in the hive, we're surrounding people with sensory immersion. Uh, you can see the different displays. Uh, that is a portable digital dome. Uh, we have one back in the States. They cost, uh, with the projector um, and a, a, a cheaper type of projector than the one here, uh, they're about $20,000, and so that's um, about the right price range to drag it around to K-12 schools, uh, you know, for kids. And uh, we're working with a fellow here in Australia who has one. Um, and uh, so, oh yes, the, the Temple of Horus, I, I told you about that a bit. Um, like I said, we took... Uh, tracings from Medina and Hobby, impose them onto a 3D model with a little bit of stone texture. And uh, uh, this is a fairly high resolution image. And uh, one of the immersive displays here is this, um, the tile display, uh, because it has a much greater resolution than all of the others. Also, you can interact with a big screen in a fundamentally different way than you interact with a small monitor. For the main thing is you can see things at the human scale, you know, like the full size it's supposed to be, um, which is you know, one less thing for your brain to do. Well, um, the reason why virtual reality, that you know, people keep adding things to the term virtual reality is that we always, if the reason why that term is expanding is because we always live in virtual reality or augmented reality, right? You know, we have a general agreement of what physical reality is, but what matters to us is different, depending on social space. In architecture, you're constantly using illusions. You know, the height of the ceiling will affect how close you're willing to get to a wall in a room things like that. Um, information is in the environment, you know? When I'm cooking uh, chicken soup or whatever, um, you know, I might array the uh, elements in the order that I put them into the soup. That's one of the keys to soup, is you put the <coughs> ingredients in, in the reverse order of their cooking time, so they all cook at the, get cooked at the same time. Why should I keep that in my brain when it's right there on my cutting board? Right? So the process of thinking isn't just in your brain, it's in your body and it's in, in the environment. Um, the, uh, that idea is called distributed cognition. And um, the ancient peoples, you know, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, who created these holy places, even, you know, even the primitive ones, they understood this very well. They created spaces that would support certain activities, you know, religious or, or practical, that sort of thing. Um, I was speaking with some uh, architects, and they were saying they don't design buildings. They don't just design spaces. They design potential experiences, and they create a space that supports those potentials. 
and, and it's the physical that supports that space. Well, in the last hundred years, well, we've always done this, we've always shaped our environment, but things have gone into overdrive now because we can build things and make things at a tremendous pace. So our, our reality is evolving rapidly. You know, here she's using a 3D printer. She's going to print herself a little Eiffel Tower or maybe a rubber human heart or something. You know, uh, pretty soon, you know, uh, you'll have big ones in your house. You can get one of these printers, one that big, for $1,200 now. Um, the resin is expensive. That's how they get you, you know. But, uh, well, why not video objects, right? Why? You know, like uh, these two students. This, by the way, is probably one of the best photographs I've ever seen. Um, it, uh, it's not really a photo. Um, these two young men are seeing a mathematical formula visualized so they can talk about it. Or in this case, so that's where we're bringing something digital into physical environment as we see it. Here, this guy is wearing uh, virtual reality goggles so that all he sees is digital, nothing but a virtual environment. But he's got that plastic gun in his hand, and that's a very important prop. It's physical. And he's in that giant hamster ball. I apologize for the low resolution. So that he can run anywhere. I actually did this, and it's, it's ridiculous, embarrassingly good fun. Um, and uh, we can create mixed realities, right? Uh, Rock Band is, was a popular game about five or six years ago. And uh, the genius of the, of the game is that you get to pretend to be a guitar player and you're up on stage, but you have that plastic guitar that is really key to bringing you into the, in, into the action. Their monitor is, is small. It would be much better if it was this size, but still, their imaginations are carrying them through. And uh, this, I'll show you this a little later, is a mixed reality using our temple, a live actress, this is a volunteer from the audience, and that is a digital puppet that I can, we, the puppeteer controls with the Xbox 360 controller. Um, so I'll, I promise I'll show you this um, a little later. So the big ideas are uh, an immersive display extends physical space into virtual space or vice versa, if you're using it right. Uh, you can feel like you're there rather than somewhere else. Uh, it lets you see more than you can see on a monitor, and that has some very important practical implications. Um, and it's really all about the narrative. It's about the story you're telling. And when you have an immersive display, you can bring things like body language and proximity you know, uh, into the story, right? Like the way we're arranged here. You know, if I start walking this way and I look toward a person, you know, that means something, right? You don't get that in a book that, uh, unless it's described. But you can uh, express that in you know, a virtual environment. So, uh, I'd like to run, run you around the room and uh, introduce the uh, different displays. Um, let's, um, let's start over here with the cylinder. So uh, people in the back might want to stand up. Uh, just gonna come up here. And uh, you'll see, is this, uh, yeah, it's so in stereo. Um, Let's see, in a, right now it's running in stereo. Um, I'll, uh, I think we'll hand out the glass, glasses in the second round. Um, you've got uh, uh, three projectors, uh, very high resolution, 1900 by, what is it? 1920 by 1200. 920 by 1200. And uh, you're, there are two images overlaid on top of each other um, so that when you put the glasses on, let's pass out the glasses. I think everyone should have a pair. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure we have enough. I think it's best if we do that after. Okay, we do have enough. Oh, we do? Okay, righto. Sorry, okay. we do have enough. All right, where are they? Right there, three right. glasses box. Hand them out, Josh. Yeah. Right. Take the box around. Right. 
Take the glasses to the people rather than the people to the glasses. All right. There you go. All right. So there's a little button on the left hand temple. Just push down on that. Press. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't that fine? Um, oh, you got one. Okay. <coughs> so um, the uh, the image, sorry, the display does 180 degrees. Um, the sweet spot, which is uh, that's a term out of audio, is uh, the display is focused right here, right. So all of the uh, all of the visuals are intended for a person standing on that spot, but because of its size, you can stand a little bit off to one side and it still looks pretty good. Um, they do have the ability to uh, head track the one observer so that when you walk <laughs> back and forth, everything looks stable, everything looks three, you know, 3D. As it is, when you move back and forth, you kind of get that the Mona Lisa is looking at me effect that you have with, uh, with paintings. Now, they could put that sweet spot anywhere in the room. There's just no reason to, particularly. Um, and this display is pretty similar to the one at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, where I did my dissertation research. And we used an earlier version of the temple for learning experiments. And we found that kids who use the, the immersive display actually learn more. Uh, we'll get into that. So, um, uh, Andrew, did you want to say anything else about the, the cylinder? I think you've covered most. Yep. OK. Um, so this next one uh, we call the wedge, or they call it the wedge. Um, it's also been referred to as a, a corner cave. And these have been around for a really long time. Now, a different set of glasses, unfortunately, yeah. so uh, don't put these so ones on. Turn the glasses. No, no, different set of glasses. Oh, I see. We won't hand those out right now. Okay. If it is, yes. All right. Now, um, the, the, my talk's going to be about 45 minutes. Then you'll have 45 minutes to just mill around the room and see everything. Um, so the, uh, the, the corner cave. Because they put the sweet spot right about here, is that right? Um, um, or where did you put it? Yeah, it's a little bit further back. I think it's take us around. Around here. Okay. Yeah. So um, the because this is a relatively large uh, corner cave, you know, you could put the sweet spot right here and get 180, or you put it back here and you get a, you get better resolution. Um, it is the least immersive of the displays here, um, except possibly the big screen. But the advantage of these is you could make one in your house. You know, you could buy a couple of projectors for $800 each, plug them into a $1,000 computer. It won't have the resolution you have here, but it'll work and it'll be immersive. So these are, are good for building them in, in schools, you know, um, you know, in your lab, that sort of thing. So I actually have one in my office back in Boston. So. Um, any question on these two displays? Um, on the stereo and so forth? Oh, yeah? OK. Um, the next one is a, is a head-mounted display. Uh, you'll get a chance to uh, play with it, with it after I'm done blathering. Um, and uh, it's intended for one person. This is an Oculus Rift. And um, for $300, it is disruptively good. You know, just uh, a couple of years ago, to get anything similar, you had to pay a couple of thousand dollars easily. Um, the resolution is only 800 by 600 for each eye. But next year, it's going to be 1080p, 1080 by something, uh, 700, I think, resolution for each eye. And at $300 a pop, anyone who really wants one can afford them. So, um, the, oh, screensaver. 
So the uh, advantage of this is that you can look in any direction you want. Um, the disadvantage is your field of view is only about 90 degrees, which is still pretty good. Um, you know, I've never bothered with head-mounted displays much over my last 20 years because you know, they, they were generally tunnel vision, like 20 or 30 degrees, which is just not great. Um, but this is now worth it. Um, it's perfect for um, individual applications. It's not so great when you're working with other people because it cuts you off from your environment. Uh, and if you want any sort of a mixed reality, like you want to see your hand, you then have to create an animated hand and you have to track the hand so you know where it is, you know, or you map your real hand to the virtual hand, blah, 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 blah. Whereas in here, you just see your hand, you know, or in one of these immersive displays. So uh, it's definitely a complementary tool. Uh, not competitive at all. Um, and then, over here is the dome. Um, the, uh, uh, later when we're, uh, when we're driving, or, you know, when, sorry, I'm going to give a talk about the temple, uh, and the second half of it will be here in the dish. So when I do that, we're going to close the curtain so you can see uh, the projection better. You know, it's, it's got only one projector that has to cover that entire space. Um, the advantage is with the sweet spot right here, how does my voice sound? It sounds really weird to me because it's bouncing straight back to my ear. Um, the, uh, I get to see up and I get to see down, you know, and I get 180 degrees. So. Uh, it, it's not 3D, it doesn't give you the stereo, but uh, in terms of the panorama, it's a much better experience. And uh, uh, it's, it's got the advantage in that because it's a single projector, the programming is a lot easier. Uh, it's really not much different from you know, getting it to work on the head-mounted display. Um, so, you tend to have fewer bugs, shorter development time, that sort of thing. Um, one thing I'd like to impress on all of you, you know, uh, I think most of you are humanities people, is this technology is very accessible to you. Um, the, uh, there, there's a huge subset of the uh, archaeology uh, community that's using uh, Unity, the same software that we built these, this model in. Uh, it's well documented, it's fairly easy to learn. Um, it, you do need to be a programmer you know, to really use it, but uh, you could get like a senior uh, in college who's doing 3D art to make all your 3D art, um, another one at that level to do the programming and make things like this. Yeah, so. Uh, definitely think about uh, collaborations with the Hive. Yeah, uh, how you can do it. So, we're back over here. Uh, oh, where's the... Oh, sorry, I put it over there. Thank it. It took me a while to think out the choreography I wanted. So, I just showed you a lot. Let me stop for a moment and ask if you've got any questions. Maybe just a moment. Any questions on the hardware, the software? No? Uh, yes? How much is the software? Um, there's a free version that's $1,500. Sorry, free version that's free. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and uh, you can do a lot with it. Uh, you can't do the warped cameras uh, or the, the head-mounted display, but you can make the 3D models. Uh, and uh, I mean, you can't do like mirror reflections, things like that. But uh, otherwise, it's the full software. Um, the full package is $1,500, and anything you make from it, you can sell. You know, it belongs to you. So you uh, produce a program that runs either on a website 
on a PC or a Mac. You can sell it and you can uh, pay a little more, I think $500, and you're able to export to an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, and then they have other devices as well you can export to. Any other questions? It, it does audio just fine. You'll see uh, as soon as we turn audio on. Uh, uh, and uh, it uses, it's based on the F mod. Sorry, Unity uses a, a free library called F mod. And that is one of the gold standards for digital sound effects people. It doesn't access all of the functions, but you can get to all the functions of F mod by you know, uh, manually, by writing your own code to access that library. Um, we put in a grant to the National Endowment for Humanities to create a sonic simulation of a uh, Roman theater to calculate the echoes to see how the music really sounded. Um, right? So um, what we're really talking about is immersion. Right? And what is immersion? Well, you can define it several ways. Right? One is, you know, you just sort of count up the different ways that you're stimulating the senses, right? How much of your field of view are you filling? How much sound? Is it taste and touch? That's sort of the mechanical definition. And you need to work with that when you're engineering your, your show. Then there's uh, developing a psychophysical response. Um, the work of Mel Slater, he's uh, in Barcelona, Spain, doing his research uh, on presence. Um, what he's saying is, if you're using the display and you come up to a cliff and it looks like you're about to fall off that cliff, if your heart goes, you know, ba -dum, and you feel like you're about to fall, then the artist succeeded you know, in, in getting you into the action. Um, but it's really all about engagement in the narrative. So, um, you know, those, those online virtual worlds, you know, where you're just looking at a little computer monitor and you're seeing a tiny little figure going around? If you put enough ego into that figure and it falls off a cliff, I mean, you'll get, uh, you, you know, you'll break out into sweat and everything. Um, you know, that's a construction of your mind. So that's a, a kind of immersion. You, you get a kind of immersion when you read a book. Um, and presence is a slightly different, slightly different concept than immersion. It's the feeling that you're there, right, rather than here physically. And that kind of goes in opposition to what I was saying about mixing reality, you know, blending reality. So there's a big literature on it. I, we don't have three days, so I can't introduce you to it. But you get the idea. So why should you care, really? You know. Um, well, 3D models are widely used in archaeology and history. Uh, computer Applications and Archaeology Conference was just here last March in Perth. Um, they had an entire track on 3D models uh, and and other simulations. Um, when you Build a model, you know, say you have your ruins of your temple and you're speculating on how to put it together. If you build a 3D model, it will force you to answer some questions. You know, when you're just describing things and showing pictures, you can leave a lot of holes. The problem with that, of course, is you're leaving the reader to build the model in their head. So you lose control of the message. Um, uh, this way, whoops. Uh, this way, you know, when you have a model, you can show it to people the way you want it to look, you as the historian. But if it's all they're seeing is a tiny one on the screen, they still have to imagine what it's like to be there. With these displays, they can just be there. So here's a couple of examples. You know, this, believe it or not, is in VRML, which is 1995 technology. Um, so the image is low resolution, but it shows how much a good artist can do, even with uh, obsolete software. This, even though it's you know 2004 work, is amazing. Um, 
I, I'm slaughtering the pronunciation, I'm sure, Papagiannakis. Um, he had people put on a head-mounted display that you see through, so they could people could see a, uh, a Greek uh, ruin, and then projected people into the field of view. So you could look around, you could see a, re a ghostly reconstruction of the ruins imposed over the physical ruins, and you see people messing around in there. Um, and this one, this is very recent, um, this is a, uh, a sound box where they're doing very carefully spatialized audio Renaissance music, and uh, the, um, the video is minimal. So, now I'm ready to give you a tour of the temple, and uh, I will reiterate some of the things I said, but uh, I, it'll be uh, in the context of an example. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm glad these chairs rotate. Um, just do a little tap of the button. If you hold it down, it'll turn off. So just a little tap of the button on the left hand. so you can read them. Uh, the Egyptians were very good at visual communication. Their temples were designed to be read by common folk. You know, like here's Pharaoh uh, thrashing the enemies of Egypt, being handed a sword of authority by the god. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, here's the name of the king over and over again. Uh, the Hawk here represents Horus in his hawk form. That is Pharaoh, protected under his mighty breast. And he's a little small, but that's an Egyptian priest. Um, the priests wore a leopard skin, uh, which indicated how important uh, they were, because the leopard skins were expensive and hard to get. Um, and he is depicted kind of a, a brick red. So uh, Egypt was multi-ethnic. Uh, it, uh, it had Caucasian, dusky-skinned uh, Greeks, Semitic peoples in the north, uh, Negro peoples in the south, uh, and a, a lot of mixing in between. So we could have drawn him as any of those, or draw him as, he, as uh, all the men are depicted in the artwork, which is a brick red. That's, that's what we went with. Um, and um, let's see. So this uh, pylon represents the, the mountains east and west of the Nile. And the central axis of the temple you know, does represent the Nile here. It, it can get a little hard to steer because it's easy to forget where the center is because you want to want to steer where your nose is. There we go. So, um, so this is the courtyard. OK, this is me pretending to be a docent at a museum. Right? So if you know any, if any museums who want to set up something like this, you, know, we, we can hook you up. Um, uh, this is the courtyard of the temple. We only have one. Uh, it was open to the sky, uh, obviously. and. Here we have an image of um, Horus, well, it's a little hard to see, you can see him better inside, uh, shoving, putting the breath of life up Pharaoh's nose. He's actually sticking it onto Pharaoh's nose, so he will live forever. Um, 
the in Egyptian temples were much like Hindu temples or Eastern Orthodox in the sense that there were a lot of people coming and going. You know, you, you, would, you might have a major ceremony going on or, you know, on one end of the courtyard and then someone else pottering around, you know, doing some other little devotional or just visiting, conducting business, that sort of thing. And um, the courtyard was for the public and it had uh, public ceremonies. Down one side is a, the artwork, a processional, which shows the um, festival of Sokar. Uh, and uh, he's, it goes in toward the temple, toward heaven. So this was a um, um, heaven uh, boy at the beginning of the year, I believe, when they were praying for you know, uh, the gods to favor Egypt. Uh, around here, you have uh, Pharaoh offering every good thing to the god. Here you see, um, unlike a real temple, we took the doors off so you could see all the way to the back. Ordinarily, there would be shut doors. That is the divine image of the god. Here's the priest, uh, once again. And here is the festival of men. Happens around harvest time. And here the procession is leading out. So that, you know, the harvests have come out of heaven. It was heaven that provided these harvests. You know, and all the goodness comes out to the land of Egypt. So uh, you notice that I used the circumference of the, of the cylinder to give my talk. Whereas if we had a flat screen, we would, I would have to be panning the view. And you want to move as little as possible because when you move too much, you make the audience sick. Uh, and here, nice and slowly. What's that? Nice and slowly. <laughs> um, so the issue is that um, you, uh, you, sorry, your, um, your body keeps your balance through three systems, your inner ear, your eye, and your sense of touch. And so your, your butt's telling you, and your inner ear are telling you that you're sitting still, but your eye is telling you that you're moving. And that creates a sensory conflict. So over time, you'll get used to it. You know, it won't bother you anymore. Uh, some people are very susceptible, others it doesn't bother them at all. Um, and uh, here is uh, the Haifa style hall, uh, that's a Greek word. Uh, the Egyptians would have called it the festival hall. And uh, it was a place uh, where a sort of a quiet place of contemplation, uh, except during you know, major ceremonies. And uh, wealthy families would have um, little shrines set up to their ancestors. So this is a statue representing all of the ancestors of a particular family. And these are offerings of food, uh, a lotus flower, and so forth. And uh, the advantage of having it in uh, the shrine here rather than separately is it would be protected from thieves. And, you bring your offerings, and then at the end of the day, the priest would deconsecrate the food and eat it. You know, the spirit of the food goes to heaven. Um, and in the back is a stella. Uh, today, we only use these for tombstones, but in the past, they were used for a lot of things. So, uh, uh, before I we switch over to the dish, you have uh, any questions on what you've seen so far of the temple uh, or uh, about the cylinder? So, without making a seat, can you actually walk around those things? Yes, I can. Whether it makes you sick uh, kind of depends on you. There we go. Uh, there's another um, shrine. Uh, we didn't have the budget to decorate the walls yet. <laughs> A real temple would have had art all over the walls. And here's the way out, which looks rather impressive. Um, 
So you'll notice that we're ascending through concentric gates. Like this is the gate of the temple, and that's the gate uh, further from the temple to the uh, compound surrounding it that leads to the village. Those two gates, this gate with the hypostyle, and then the gate behind us that goes into the inter, inter sanctuary. Now, did anyone else get the effect that Jeff was actually walking through that uh, gateway just there? Ah, yes. Because the stereo is telling you that these objects are further out. So, um, in real life, you're, you're using your, your two eyes to detect depth. You only do that out to a distance of about 8 to 12 feet. Um, and you use other cues for distant objects. So what you're seeing here is kind of a hyper reality. You know, you're, you're, you're sort of getting sort of this extra 3D hit uh, through the stereo block system. That's pretty neat. All right, um, let's uh, switch over here to the uh, to the dome. Take your uh, glasses off again. shut the curtain uh, as soon as everyone's in, or at least nearby. While you're doing that, I'm going to start something. Okay. 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 to anyone who wants to stand right here. Because when you stand here, the columns look perfectly straight. Much. Um, Isn't that nice? Now, it's your peripheral vision that senses motion. So with this, if you have motion sickness issues, it'll, I mean, this will really get you. Oh, great. Well, if you're standing back there, it'll be less of a less of a problem. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm flying. Yeah. 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 Yeah
they would place the image of the god, the divine image of the god, uh, sorry, a smaller version, into a shrine, wrap it in linen, put it on a boat, and carry it through the village for uh, ceremonies, generally falling under the term Egyptian oracle. Um, the carrying the Virgin Mary around <coughs> in Europe today is descended from this, because a great deal of the form and format of Christian ceremony comes straight from ancient Egypt, because the Egyptian culture, you know, it took a good three, four hundred years to wind down after its conquest by the Romans. And the Romans were fascinated with Egypt. So the early Christians, as they became institutionalized, they took on a lot of those trappings. Um, so uh, on the left are scenes from the daily cult, uh, where Pharaoh or the high priest would uh, come before the divine image, uh, take it out, clothe it, bathe it, feed it, you know. Um, an Egyptologist, the, um, she's uh, in charge of the Egypt collection at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, top of her profession. I asked her, What's, what is this all about? And she said, the gods want what you want. They want to be loved and cared for. So you love and care for them, and they will love and care for you. So you've reached these tremendous heights of civilization, and it's all about something very primal, ultimately. Um, anyway, so we've ascended through all these gateways, right? And the shrine itself is the last gate. It's the gateway to heaven. And by entreating the god um, Pharaoh or the high priest, uh, encourages the god to let the blessings of heaven flow out to the land of Egypt. So there you go. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, the sand would have been combed. It would not have had, it, it wouldn't have been rippled like this. Yes, exactly. But we don't, we didn't have enough pixels to work with to make it look like a Zen garden. So I did ripple sand, which we all understand. So that's a deliberate, um, uh, how should I say, uh, something that's deliberately wrong put in to put, create the right impression. So you want to control the image. Where what I'm trying to do is, is creating an experience for you in your mind. Okay. And, yes, <laughs> with help from the God, yes, we need it. So. All right, so uh, uh, so just when you thought the immersive displays are the, the last thing, I'll show you something amazing that flat screen can do. So let's go on over. incredible number of pixels. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Good, good. good, good. Yeah, moving you around physically actually makes a big difference. You know? um, so, this is the temple again. Look at that resolution, right? How many pixels does this display have? 24 million. 24 million <laughs> pixels. We're only using 12 of them right now. Um, and uh, the the images that we used to construct the temple 
are not big enough to sort of use all those pixels, but the lighting effects make it worthwhile, uh, the shading. So we go in, all right. So this is the beginning of a play, a digital puppet show, the Egyptian Oracle that I, I showed you a picture of earlier. And it begins with a live actress. My dear one. And there you can see uh, Horus Ammon sticking the ark of Pharaoh's nose. That's where, you know, in the Bible, the breath of life, that idea, similar story. Okay. Now, since uh, we've seen the temple a lot, I'm going to jump ahead to the next scene. That was the offering table. And uh, we're seeing a procession that would have emerged from the uh, inner sanctuary. <clears throat> we steered you around this column because we couldn't figure out how to get him to go down the steps very nice. With, <laughs> within our budget, that is. That is the high priest Pettiasi of the temple. You see his leopard skin there. These are lower ranking priests. Um, everybody spent, uh, our men spent two months out of the year. Oh, that's nice. Hello. Oh. Just minimized. How funny. It's a big honor to carry the shrine, um, the shrine. This processional would have been much grander, um, but uh, the priest would pose questions to the god, and because it's like a Ouija board, you know, a bunch of people holding onto it, it'll, it'll move a bit, and he interprets the movements as the answer of the god. And particularly in the late period, uh, a lot of important business got done in this way. Uh, in fact, there was one period um, where about half of Egypt was ruled by the god Osiris through the oracle. Yeah. And uh, the priest here is a digital puppet. I'm controlling him with the Xbox. Hello. Greetings, everyone. I am Pedyesi, high priest of the temple. And this is the Bark of Horus. And that's Jeff. He's kind of a jerk. Um, I'm not a puppeteer. I'm, I'm really not good at this at all. But puppeteering is like music or writing. Anybody can do it, you know? Um, in the hand of a professional puppeteer, he's amazing. He, he really lives. And we worked with the puppeteer to develop him. So um, uh, in the show, we would have the live actress would stand here. Um, and we would have members of the audience volunteer to come up and pose as people who had business before the Oracle, like you're running for mayor, or two people who have a dispute, you know, a, a wall that between their houses collapsed, you know, and the, the Oracle would choose between them. There we go. So what's great about the displays here is that every one of them has something on all the others.
right, right now it's just scripted because we, we didn't want any chance for messing it up. So the only thing I can do is move him uh, and I can make the vote uh, choose the person on the right or the person on the left. And uh, these motions are consistent with scripture. Um, I can also make the vote do kind of a disapproving motion. That, <laughs> you, <laughs> music. And this is an approving motion, happy or yes or whatever. So there you are. Um, so, uh, it's uh, it's a little late. I can I just have uh, a few more slides. I think I might skip them uh, unless you really want to see them. I can show you in person. Actually, um, let me throw it open for questions, and then I'll let you guys mill around and play with the displays. Just doing the artwork for this would be a Yes. Please join me.